Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome back to Primate Conversations. Uh, today, we are joined by Dr. Michelle Brown, who is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at UC Santa Barbara, uh, where she co-directs the Biobehavioral Health Lab Laboratory. Uh, she's also founder and director of Ngogo Monkey Project in Kibale National Park, Uganda. Dr. Brown has a background in cognitive neuroscience and evolutionary primatology, and her research focuses on competition at several levels uh, amongst individuals, groups, and species. Um, having learned pretty quickly during my own field work uh, just how hard it is to study one troop of one species of monkey, I am in awe of the number of uh, groups studied by Michelle and her, and her group. Um, uh, by my count, it looks like over 20 uh, groups of at least five species of monkey. Um, she's running an impressive range of research projects and activities, uh, which we really look forward to hearing more about today uh, in her talk on competitive dynamics in a frugivore primate guild. Um, and as usual, if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat box on, um, on YouTube. And with that, uh, welcome, Michelle, and um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Let me uh, move you guys to a different screen. And then I will share my screen. All right, how does that look? Uh, can you guys see my slides and everything? Yeah, it looks great. Super. Okay. So I will be talking about competitive interactions today. Uh, but this time, instead of talking about competition within a species, I am focusing on competition between species and its trickle down effects. Now, when I talk about a frugivore guild, what does that mean? A feeding guild is a set of species that are occupying the same habitat and consuming largely the same foods. And in this case, those foods are lar largely ripe fruits. So uh, fruit eating primate is, is a frugivore. Now, that's not to say that they only eat ripe fruit, it's their preferred food item, but when ripe fruit is unavailable to them, they do fall back on other items, unripe fruit, young leaves, flowers, and especially insects. So of the five species that you see here, there are three that I'm going to focus on today. So we have the blue monkeys up top, gray-cheeked mangabees next, and the red-tailed monkeys. And these three species are all the arboreal fruit-eating monkeys found in Kibale National Park in Uganda. And they regularly co-occur together throughout the forests of East Africa. The other two species we have here, the Loesti monkey and an olive baboon. And I won't really be talking about these two species today, so stay tuned for future research on those guys. So when we're talking about feeding competition, of course, we are talking about uh, access to food and how individuals compete or how groups compete for access to those food items. And this is a topic that has been studied extensively, especially for primates. But I think that we have a lot left to learn. So food is a fundamental factor in the lives of these animals. They spend most of the day searching for it, consuming it, digesting it, and often fighting over access to it. And access to these resources shapes the competitive regimes that we see uh, within species, between species, and that's thought to have these trickle down effects on the nature of social relationships for individuals, um, not just how frequently they fight, but also how often they cooperate and what relations or what, what is the particular dynamic among individuals, especially within these social groups. And to really understand the role that food plays in the lives of these animals, we first have to ask, what is food? All right, it might seem like a simple question, but uh, this is something that is actually a little bit more challenging than you might expect. So for instance, in conducting my dissertation research, I first went into the literature, I looked at everything that had ever been published on the diet of red-tailed monkeys, which is what you see here. And especially from uh, the Kibali forest. And I came up with this list of top food items. And then I designed a monitoring census, a phenology census to track the availability of foods at the site in Kibali where I work. <sighs> and that turned out to be um, not quite as useful as I would have hoped, because an item, a particular tree species that was a very important part of the diet at a nearby site in the same forest, 
turns out to not have been important at all for Ngogo red-tailed monkeys, even though that same food item is available. So just because something is present doesn't mean the animals are gonna eat it. And if they do eat it, are they eating it as much as it's available or is there something that sort of limits their access to that food item? And food is relative, right? So primates are consuming particular foods uh, in order to sort of uh, attain a particular ratio of nutrients in their diet. And so they, they consume a variety of options. And a food like the Monodora flowers that you see here on the screen might be preferred in some seasons, but not in others, based on what else is available in their home range at that time. So it's actually a bit more challenging to you know, figure out what is food for a particular group or a particular population, and then how do we measure it? So uh, again, this phenology census that I had designed, it was using pretty common methods that a lot of different researchers have used. But what I discovered over and over and over again in trying to use this phenology data is that it did not predict the behavior of the groups that I was following. And there were red-tailed monkeys and great cheek mangabees at the time that I was following. And for some reason, phenology was just not predicting the various uh, aspects of food competition that I was interested in. So that was, that was particularly baffling. So I think that we need to sort of reevaluate how we measure food availability. So I'll talk more about this in the coming slides. So there's the food availability side of the equation in terms of how do we figure out what animals are gonna be competing over. And then there's the types of uh, interactions that we can measure, the competitive interactions. And for primatology, especially a lot of the focus has been on competition between individuals within one social group, right? And in particular, how does that result in dominance hierarchies? How does that uh, lead to differential access to these resources? And that's a really important aspect of competition because it is at the individual level. And these social groups are a strong organizing uh, level of social complexity in the lives of these animals. Now, for much of my work, I have focused on competition between social groups of the same species. Uh, partly because this is an understudied aspect of their lives and partly because it's thought to have these really strong influences on the nature of cooperation among individuals. So the more competition that you see between social groups, the more uh, cooperation you should see within those groups to successfully defend their access to these resources. And what we're leaving out historically especially for this discipline, are the interactions between species. And this is really uh, sort of bubbled up to the surface of, of what I think about on a day-to-day -day basis while working in Kibali because the forest is dripping with primates, all right? So in addition to the three arboreal monkey species that I mentioned, we have the uh, relatively large-bodied gray cheek mangabees, and then next down in size are the blue monkeys, and then the smallest diurnal fruit-eating primate uh, is the red-tailed monkey, but all three of those species are also competing with chimpanzees, which are much, much larger bodied, living in the same forest, eating from the same trees, and have highly overlapping diets with these monkey species. So how are they affecting each other? And uh, you would expect that there would be quite a lot of competition given how much primate biomass or frugivore biomass is in this forest. And yet, especially among the monkeys, we rarely see direct aggression or even agonism between species. Agonism is much more frequent within the species than it is between species. So that's, again, a bit surprising given the nature of, of how resource limited these individuals are. So to give you an idea of how similar their diets are, this is a right mixture triangle showing the diets of four, uh, five species in um, using nutritional geometry. Uh, and this figure comes from a paper by Robinheimer et al. Uh, but it uses, especially for the chimpanzees, the mangabees, blue monkeys, and red-tailed monkeys, uh, data from an older study by Rangham, Conklin, Britton, and Hunt uh, from Kibali. And so what we see here is that if you look at the the nutritional composition of their diets. The three monkey species are very closely clustered here in, in uh, nutrient space. Chimpanzees are a little bit askew, so they have a bit lower ratio of protein compared to 
carbohydrates and uh, fiber. Mountain gorillas have also been thrown in this uh, figure for comparison, but I'm not really gonna uh, talk about these guys very much. And um, let me sort of explain now that there's this roadmap that uh, will guide you through this talk today. So in terms of looking at competitive interactions within a forest, uh, first, I'm going to talk about some of the research that we have looking at the effect of chimpanzees on red-tailed monkeys. Second, the effect of mangabees on those same red-tailed monkeys. And then third, I will uh, show you some of the ongoing work that we have uh, looking at the effect of mangabees on blue monkeys. So the idea here is that there is this size-based interspecies dominance hierarchy. We have mangabees that are, oh, sorry, <laughs> that's not a mangabee, chimpanzees that are the largest by far, uh, and they are dominant for another reason, which I'll, I will get to shortly. The next largest species is the mangabee, then the blue monkey, and then the red tail. So the red tail is the smallest primate in the forest, the smallest frugivore, is really having to contend with a landscape full of competitors that it cannot physically dominate. And that seems to structure a lot of its uh, socioecology. Now, none of this research that I'm describing today would be possible without the wonderful uh, field team that I have in Uganda. Uh, so these guys really uh, not only help with the data collection, but they just um, make working there a real pleasure. So this is uh, the, well, okay, we have Africa here, we have Uganda here in East Africa. And the site where we were working is the Ngogo Research Station in the middle of the northern part of Kibali National Park, which is in the western side of Uganda. So it's a very uh, interesting place to work because the primate biomass is so high. And uh, the, the Ngogo site is a little bit remote compared to other research sites uh, in Uganda. And I chose to work there initially because of the high biomass of primates. So if you're going to study intergroup conflict, you need a lot of social groups so that you have a reasonable sample size of conflicts to uh, document. And this was the place to go for that particular project. Since then, I have stayed. So um, and let me jump forward in time. To, uh, this is uh, Ronnie Steinitz is a current graduate student in my uh, lab group. And for her dissertation, she's focusing on red tail energetics, looking at how they're affected by competition with chimpanzees. And the first thing that we sort of pulled out of the data set that I had accumulated from 2012 to 2015 is that there's a bit of a mismatch here. So we are looking at red tailed monkey EB, which is energy balance, which we ascertain by looking at urinary C-peptide of insulin. This is a biomarker that tells us about uh, circulating glucose and insulin in the bloodstream. And what we should see is that when food availability is high, energy balance should also be high. They should have energy to spare. Uh, but in fact, we're kind of seeing the opposite pattern. So the green dotted line here is unripe fruit availability. And then the purplish dotted line down here is ripe fruit availability. And the black solid line is the red tail energy balance. And what we see is that red tail energy balance is highest at times when uh, fruit availability is relatively low. So especially here and a uh, little bit here. So this doesn't exactly match our predictions of how these frugivores should be responding to fruit availability. And this is also surprising given that for another species at the same site or in the same forest, uh, these are chimpanzees. What we see is that they're really, their consumption of fruit follows fruit availability. They're preferring it, they're seeking it out. Uh, if it's not available in this valley, they wander over to the next valley and, and help themselves to all the ripe fruits. And this is a very common chimpanzee pattern. So when there's more ripe fruit that is available, they consume it in higher quantities and they have higher energy balance using that same biomarker C peptide. So why would the red tails not follow this pattern? Well, I'm sure you have an idea, but what, what got me started thinking about this issue or the relationship between species was a conversation that I had with uh, an individual who was studying chimpanzees at this same site. And I happened to mention that 2008 was a terrible, terrible year for red tails. 
they were so skinny, it was like they had uh, potholes behind their shoulder blades or on their hips. The tails were so emaciated that you could see every single vertebra, um, and they were clearly not doing well. And the chimp researcher then said, well, that's strange, because 2008 was a great year for chimpanzees. Uh, tons of food, uh, a lot of babies were born that year. Uh, so that was a really striking contrast. Why are the red tails starving when the chimps are doing so well, when there's clearly food available? So uh, the data that I'm showing you for this first section of the talk is uh, focused on red-tailed monkeys, and it's uh, the six groups that you see here on the right. Uh, so they're all neighbors and they have, uh, these are the 95% polygons in the, the dark outer border. And then the dark shaded interior is the 50% core area. So you can see that there's a fair amount of overlap between home ranges, usually 20% between two adjacent neighbors, approximately 20%. And the thing to keep in mind is that red-tailed monkeys are not only physically small, but they have a small spatial area that they occupy as a group. So uh, the red-tailed monkeys, males or females and males weigh two to five kilograms. Chimpanzees are an order of magnitude larger. And the red-tailed home range is about a third of a square kilometer, whereas for chimpanzees at this site, it's about 35 to 38 square kilometers. So two orders of magnitude larger. So the red-tailed groups that I've been studying uh, sort of characteristic red-tailed traits. They have one male per group and lots of adult females and then the kids. Uh, the females are phylopatric, so they're living with their sisters, their mothers, grandmothers, nie aunts, nieces, etc. And oops, sorry. Um, they show weak within group social relationships and especially in terms of dominance. Uh, it's so infrequent to observe agonism among individuals that we cannot construct a linear dominance hierarchy. But there is very strong between group contest competition. So groups often meet and 40% of those encounters are aggressive on average. So this biomarker that I mentioned, C-peptide of insulin, uh, it increases with circulating glucose levels in the bloodstream. And uh, so there's this positive relationship. So just keep that in mind. More food, higher energy balance, higher C-peptide. And uh, or at least it should be more food. So more food intake, I should say. The thing about C-peptide though, is that it does also indicate something uh, interesting, which is energy status indicated by fat reserves. Uh, and that's the baseline of C-peptide. So heavier individuals will have a higher baseline. They're producing more insulin. And then that spikes when they've consumed food that is turned into glucose. And when I say energy balance, what I'm referring to is the difference between energy that's taken in versus energy that is expended. So for this project, um, this again, this is 2012 to 2015, we have about 1500 urine samples from 110 individual red-tailed monkeys from six social groups. And this includes 77 adult females. And we have approximately two samples per individual per observation period. So an observation period is usually uh, a week. Sometimes it's a little bit longer. Um, and this is, uh, you know, would I like to have more urine? Of course, of course. Uh, but it's a little bit challenging to get little drops of urine from monkeys that are high up in the trees and you know, kind of scatters as it, as it comes down. So this is, an achievement to have collected as, as much urine as we do have here. So I assayed these samples at the Hominoid Reproductive Ecology Lab led by Melissa Marie Thompson at the University of New Mexico. And I used radio immunoassay kits from Millipore Sigma. And uh, these kits are pretty reliable in terms of measuring this, this biomarker because it's very conserved from humans to uh, Cercopithecine monkeys. So, here I'm showing the pattern of observations, uh, the observation periods per group across the years. And so each group is indicated in a different color. So this is group R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6. And the, the blue shading behind them indicates the wet seasons. So uh, again, we had you know, maybe one or two observation periods per month per group. And we typically followed two groups at a time. 
And this is, you know, the limit of what I could achieve given the, the manpower that I had at the time. And so we would follow a pair of groups, get my cursor back, uh, for a couple of months. And then we would switch to a different pair or trio of groups. And then I would go back to the US, uh, analyze some samples, come back to Uganda, we'd follow a different pair of groups and switch it up. So we tried to follow each pair of groups in different seasons. And um, uh, this was to sort of maximize our coverage of group level variation. So these are the C peptide averages per group, per observation month. And what you see is a lot of variation. Okay. So uh, from 2012 through 2015, uh, we followed the groups R5 and R6. These are two adjacent groups in this period, this period, and this period. Whereas we have R1 and R3 here, or, sorry, uh, R2 up here and R3 here. And again, here and uh, here, um, and then this is the R4, R1 groups. So we kept following R2 up here, but we had switched midway between the other neighboring groups. So again, this is to sort of maximize our coverage across different seasons. And R2 is the sort of uh, central group where all these other neighbors are scattered around them. And R2 does happen to be the smallest group in the area, but uh, it, all groups have shown a little bit of growth over the years. So let's get back to our main question. Do chimpanzees alter the relationship between food availability and energy balance for red-tailed monkeys? And this is looking at chimpanzees not only as a competitor for fruit resources, but also as a predator, right? So chimpanzees are notorious for consuming red colobus monkeys and whatever forest that they co-occur in. But we have very few red colobus monkeys left at Ngogo. The chimpanzees ate probably 90% of the population as it was documented uh, 40, 50 years ago. So uh, that means that there's a lot more opportunistic snatching and grabbing of other monkey species. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hunting these other monkey species is not quite as effective as it would be with red colobus because the monkeys respond differently to the threat of chimpanzee presence. Uh, so this is why there's not so much directed hunting of these other monkey species, but instead the sort of snatch and grab. So what we did is think about what is the availability of food within the red tail home range, this tiny little space, and then the broader chimpanzee home range. Now, as I had mentioned before, so there's different river valleys within the chimpan very large chimpanzee home range and chimps follow the fruit for the most part. So if fruit is uh, highly available way over in the West, there's gonna be a lot more of a chimp presence in the West than there would be in the East. So that would be good for the red-tailed monkeys in the East because they could have some relief from the chimpanzee presence. Uh, so the expectation here is that when red tail food availability is low, this is the red tail home range, this gold polygon, uh, and then the larger chimpanzee range is the darker outline. And so if, if the chimp competition here is low because the chimp foods are in another part of the chimp home range, uh, we should see a more direct relationship between food availability for red tails within their home range and red tail energy balance. So here, uh, low red tail energy balance because they have low food availability and then high red tail energy balance when there's higher food availability, okay? So uh, we're just predicting a positive relationship based on the red tail foods if chimpanzee competition is low. That's exactly what we see, all right? So down here on the x-axis, we have the important ripe fruit for red tails within their home range as assessed through our phenology records. We have red tail energy balance on the y-axis as indicated by C peptide levels. And I'm going to show you different lines within this plot that tell you the relationship between these two factors based on how frequently chimpanzees are in the red tail home range. And we index this using the uh, chimp phenology with different set of phenology data uh, because that indicates where their food is available. So basically when chimp phenology scores are really, really high, chimps are gonna be drawn to that area because it's the ripe fruit that they're seeking out. Now, so 
uh, when chimp competition is high, meaning that they're in the red-tailed home range a lot because there's a lot of chimp foods there, uh, what pattern are we going to see? Well, this is what happens. It actually flips the original relationship. So even though fruit availability for red tails is high here, because there's a lot of chimpanzees in their home range, they don't have the freedom to move around. They don't have the freedom to, to eat from whatever tree that they like. In fact, most of the time they're hiding from the predatory chimpanzees. And so we see this really steep drop in their energy balance levels. And if we think about sort of the intermediate levels of chimp pressure on red tails, we see this nice gradient uh, that tracks with the intensity of chimpanzee competition. So what does this mean? This means that food availability cannot track directly onto red tail energy balance because chimpanzees are interfering with that relationship. They're mediating it. And uh, this means that there's, well, my life got a little bit harder. Okay. <laughs> if I want to understand how much food is available for red tails and then use that to predict their competitive regimes within the red tail uh, groups or between red tail groups, I have to know what's going on with other species, especially with chimpanzees. So again, we see that chimpanzees are interfering with this relationship between food and energy gain. And this is really important. The competition from chimpanzees is variable over time. It fluctuates. So I think historically there's been this uh, latent assumption that between species competition isn't necessarily something that we have to put into the primate socioecological models because it's just a constant pressure. And what we're seeing here is that is definitely not the case. It is a variable pressure that um, is more intense at some times than at other times. So like I said, measuring food availability just got a lot tougher. And this affects the question of when is food economically defendable? So economic defendability is the idea that uh, we're gonna see competition over access to food resources if access to that food limits fitness and that food is monopolizable in the sense that you can evict some other individual from that resource or some other group from that resource. We cannot begin to understand that until we understand what else is happening that affects the relationship between the food availability and the ability of smaller consumers to consume to access that food. So that's all well and good, but maybe this is something that is specific to Ngogo because you have the chimpanzees, you have the red tails. So what would happen at other sites? Is this a generalizable relationship or is it specifically because chimps eat monkeys? Right, so not all apes are known for eating monkeys. So if we go to say uh, Democratic Republic of Congo under the Congo River where there's bonobos, which are not known for eating monkeys, not the way that chimpanzees are, are we gonna see the same pattern with the monkeys in that area? Or if we go to Indonesia where there's orangutans, are the orangutans going to have the same effect on the smaller bodied monkeys as chimpanzees do? We don't know. Similarly, if we go to South America, Central America, uh, and there's no apes there, there's no primate that is as large and as dominant as an ape, what kind of pattern are we gonna see there between food availability and consumption? So these are some of the long-term questions that uh, members of my lab group are looking to address. Now, I wanna go back to this uh, figure showing you the C peptide of the, the group means over different months and years. And I really wanna highlight that there's not just temporal variability in energy balance, there's also a, a huge amount of group level variation at the same time, okay? So uh, what is this? September, 2012, this is the mean C peptide level for the R3 group uh, versus the R2 group. And you see that these are very distinct uh, uh, spreads, group spreads. And this is a consistent pattern. So R5 is always doing better than R6, same here, same here. And R2 is always doing better than R3, R1, R4. And here, uh, well, yeah, they're still mostly higher than these guys and here as well. So what might drive these group level differences in C-peptide? So first of all, 
it's not about quality of the home range. Okay, so this figure shows you the basal area of food trees in the core area and the periphery of each red tail home range. So the core is in gray and then the periphery is in white. And the two groups that consistently have higher C peptide levels are R2 and R5, but they do not have more food that's available in their home range as assessed through these botanical plots. Same thing goes if we look at the phenology census, there's no consistent difference in terms of food availability within their home ranges. Uh, and even if we adjust for group size, so I mentioned that R2 is the smallest group that we have here, and R5 is the second largest group. So it's, it's not just about how many mouths there are to feed in the group. Uh, there's something else going on. Uh, so this leads me to the second part of the talk here, where now I'm gonna be focusing on the effect of mangabees on the red-tailed monkeys. So I think that mangabee pressure can explain why two groups Let's see, this is R2 and this is R5. These two groups usually have a much higher energy balance than the neighboring groups. And if you look at these two maps, so this, this is the Ngogo Trail system here, uh, these lighter green bits with a little bit of brown in here, these are the grasslands. So uh, Kibali is largely you know, old growth, tropical rainforest, but it is mixed in with a, a few different habitats, including grasslands, regenerating woodlands, uh, riverine swamps, and uh, papyrus swamps, swamps. So the red tails <laughs> kind of form a carpet throughout the forest part uh, or the forest habitat. And mangabees also occur in these areas, but they have these larger home ranges. So there's fewer mangabee groups. And mangabees will push into these sort of fingers of forest over here. And it looks like they're using this grassland area, but they're really not. They just kind of move around the edges of it. But when you're drawing these kernel polygons, it forms these blobs. So the red tail group over here, the R4 group, and we're gonna ignore R13. This is from a slightly different aspect of the study. The R4 group is in an area that's not old growth forest. It's regenerating forest. It's, it's sort of a savanna woodland forest matrix. Uh, and it's actually kind of a crappy habitat. There's not a lot of food availability here. Uh, so they're, they're kind of in the worst possible situation given the six study groups here. Now this gap that we see here in the Mangabee home ranges, there, there used to be a Mangabee group here. All right, in 2008 and nine, when I was doing my dissertation research at the same site, the M1 group was in this spot. When I came back in 2012, they were gone, all right? And I think what was happening, actually, I'm uh, a little bit ahead of myself. So I'm gonna backpedal a bit and tell you a little bit more about red tails and mangabees and how they compare to each other. So they have a lot of similarities. Um, not only are they eating many of the same foods or most of the same foods, um, but the group sizes are about the same. Now that sort of masks a little bit of difference in terms of sexual competition within the group. So red tails have only one male per group. Mangabees have about three, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, the red tail home range is one fifth the size of a mangabee home range. And mangabees are twice the size in terms of body mass uh, as red tails. But in both cases, females are phylopatric. So these are some of the key elements here when we're thinking about feeding competition, the fact that females are phylopatric and they're eating the same foods is really important to keep in mind. All right, now this gap that we see here in the mangabee home ranges, I think what's happening is that a, a, a female golden cat had sort of moved into this area and she produced a kit and she was feeding that kit. Uh, and I think she was feeding it monkeys probably mangabees. Uh, that might've explained why that whole group disappeared. And we searched and searched for them for months. They were definitely gone. And uh, so that would explain why no other mangabee groups moved into this area. This remained sort of this vacant patch that had formerly been occupied by a very competitive group. So this sort of sets up a, a variable landscape of competition between mangabees and red tails. 
So these two groups that typically have the very highest peptide levels, their core areas are in this area that is either completely unoccupied by manganese or lightly occupied right here. Uh, whereas the other red-tailed groups here, uh, these guys have manganese that they are consistently competing with. And the R4 group, um, they didn't have a manganese group here, but again, they, they're occupying this home range that is of poor quality because it's a lot of rocks and grass and um, shrubby little trees that don't produce a whole lot of fruit. So we have been thinking about these red tail groups in sort of two categories, those that have low overlap and low competition with mangabees, indicated here in teal, and those that have high competition, high overlap with mangabees. And if we look at their C-peptide levels, this is what tracks. So the, those two groups that have the low competition or low overlap with mangabees have consistently higher C-peptide levels than the other groups. Now, the groups that have high energy balance also have a higher ratio of infants to adult females. So if, if this is a measure of group pro productivity, how often are females reproducing? It seems to be more often than the other th uh, four groups. But it's unclear whether this is because they simply have more food and they can turn that into infants more quickly, reducing their interbirth intervals or if instead maybe there's high infant mortality and so females are coming into estrus sooner than they would have if they had a surviving infant. It does not currently look like it's high infant mortality, but I need to do a little bit more analysis here to, um, uh, to determine what exactly is happening with these two groups. So at the moment, it's suggestive of higher food, shorter interbirth intervals, but um, stay tuned. I spent the previous year and a half uh, measuring estradiol and progesterone from the fecal, fecal samples I had collected from these red-tailed monkeys. And this allowed me to determine whether females were pregnant. And so I detected 57 pregnancies. Uh, and of those, 35 with a known outcome. So we were with the group long enough to determine what happened with that pregnancy. Was it successful and resulted in a live birth? or was it an unsuccessful pregnancy that either resulted in a stillbirth or a miscarriage? And of those 35 pregnancies, 14 were unsuccessful. So they resulted in a stillbirth or a miscarriage. And uh, the two groups that typically have high energy balance had sort of a, a within range level of unsuccessful uh, pregnancies. So these are the groups that have lower energy balance and their rate of unsuccessful pregnancies range from zero to 69%. So these guys are sort of smack in the middle here. And that's all well and good, but you know what we do see is that there's a bit of clustering in terms of these 14 unsuccessful pregnancies. So again, showing you this figure of group level C-peptide means across time. And these are the years where we were really able to focus in on the, the reproductive status of the females. And down here, these brackets indicate the peak birth seasons in 2013 and 2014. So that typically runs from about late December through late March. And these asterisks here indicate the unsuccessful pregnancies. So this, the position of the asterisk indicates which group this uh, unsuccessful pregnancy occurred in. So here it was R3, and then here, I believe it was R4. Um, and then up here, this one is for R2. These two were for R5, and then these were for R6. So we see this, oh, sorry, getting ahead of the punch. Uh, <laughs> a lot of unsuccessful pregnancies in this R6 group in this birth season and it seems to be that these were clustered here because it also happened to be one of the highest periods, most intense periods of chimpanzee competition that we've ever recorded. It was one of, there are basically these two peaks and this was one of those peaks. Um, now the other peak of high chimpanzee competition, chomp, occurred here, not in a birth season. And uh, so we didn't see any miscarriages there, but or unsuccessful pregnancies, but we also weren't sampling intensively. So the, the co-occurrence of high chimpanzee competition 
birthing season resulted in a lot of miscarriage or unsuccessful pregnancies in this particular group, but why not in our five? There were a lot of pregnancies here, but not a lot of unsuccessful ones. And again, I think that this sort of relates to the competition from the Mangabe groups. So R5, again, is a group that does not have much overlap with a Mangabe group, whereas R6 has pretty extensive, it's completely overlapped by at least one Mangabe group. So this combination of chimpanzee competition in and of itself is not enough to affect both groups. Uh, instead, when you add in the Mingabee competition, that led to a lot of reproductive failures in this particular season. So again, it's not enough to know what's going on with the red tail groups. That's not going to explain some of the patterns that we see in competitive interactions, social relationships, and in reproductive outcomes. We really have to understand what's going on with the other species in the forest and how they're, uh, the variable pressures that they're applying to red tails uh, are affecting the red tail fitness parameters. Now, another aspect that we see here between the groups that have the low competition with mangabees because they have very little home range overlap versus the groups that have high overlap with mangabees is that the number of intergroup conflicts per day corresponds very nicely with these differences. So the groups that compete a lot with mangabees have a lower rate of intergroup conflict than the groups that don't compete with mangabees. So there's basically a stifling effect of between species competition on between group competition within a species. So these guys are two and our five. They have frequent intrusions into their home range by the neighboring groups, and they actually show territorial boundaries, whereas these guys do not. All right, so it's, it's much more of a sort of loosey-goosey, who knows who's going to win this interaction unless it happens to be at a territorial boundary with one of these two groups. So even within the population, there's variation in how they uh, express intergroup conflict. And the interesting thing is that the first time I realized that only some of the groups have territorial boundaries and the other groups don't really have those boundaries, um, at least among themselves, that is. I thought I was going crazy. Like, how could this be possible? I, I'd never read anything that sort of indicated that this was something that could happen within a population or within a, um, a research site until I went back to some of the older literature that Tom Strusaker had published on not only the same species, but these same groups in Kibale National Park. And so 40 years earlier, he had seen this exact type of variation. Some red tail groups had territorial boundaries and others did not. And so this, suggests to me that there's a history of variable between species competition that red tails experience, which leads to this interesting sort of dichotomy of um, how well groups are doing over time. And in fact, what we see is that some red tail groups have fissioned regularly over the last 40, 50 years. In other groups, we haven't observed any fissions. All right, so there could be some very long-term widespread population level genetic effects of between species competition. So hopefully we'll get to look at that in more detail soon. Now these intergroup conflicts are a really important part of red tail life. Uh, so they do fight for access to food trees. And what I recently showed in, in a publication um, in Phil Trans is that the costs of losing a conflict are, are negligible. In fact, if anything, the losing groups, uh, this is their energy balance at the time of the encounter and then the next day. Um, and this is before the encounter on the same day, after the encounter on the same day. So the losing group actually seems to still be increasing its C-peptide level, its energy balance. These are control days without an intergroup encounter. And then these are encounters that end in a draw. There's not much difference. Whereas uh, for groups that win, they start off with a relatively low energy balance. And by winning that conflict, by pushing the other group out of the tree, they're able to improve their energy balance up to normal levels by the following day. So there are really substantial energetic benefits of winning an encounter. Uh, and uh, like I said, the two groups that have really uh, consistently high energy balance levels, they have a lot of these encounters because the neighbors are constantly sort of pushing in on their home ranges. Now, they don't always win these encounters. It's sort of a mix. And there does not seem to be anything like a dominance hierarchy. It's 
seems to be based more on need, immediate need. So to recap, what effect do mango bees have on red tail monkeys? Uh, well, mango bees, the, the competition from mango bees appears to affect red tail energy gain, reproductive rate, and their intergroup relationships. So it really is insufficient to look at red tails in isolation. We have to consider what else is going on in the forest that could be affecting them. So this is the last part, um, and this is short <laughs> uh, because this is very much still a work in progress. Uh, so here I'm focusing on blue monkeys, and I want to start off with um, sort of an homage to uh, Jer Dr. Jeremiah Luwanga, who really inspired a lot of this work. Uh, so he had studied the blue monkeys at Ngogo for his master's thesis. And in many conversations with Dr. Luwanga, um, we talked about what was happening with the blue monkeys currently at the site. And they have continued to have this really low population or small population size whereas all the other primate species have really increased pretty dramatically at Ngogo um, because there is a lot of food there. So what was going on with the blue monkeys? Why are they not increasing? And uh, you know, this, this really motivated me to take up this question and uh, to start doing some research on the blue monkeys there. So uh, in a recently published paper, this is with Hannah Frog, who's uh, one of the graduate students in my lab. This is her first, first author publication, yay Hannah. And with Nick Thompson Gonzalez, who uh, has been working with us in the biobehavioral health lab at UCSB. Uh, we compiled all the data that we could find on the Ngogo blue monkeys and even on the Kanyawara blue monkeys from Kibali and also from the competing species. And the scale here is, is sort of obscuring the fact that all these species have increased over the last 50-ish years, um, but some more so than others. So the red tails at Ngogo have increased by 109%. And in that same period, the Ngogo blues have increased only 17%, whereas mango bees have increased 88%, and chimps for the much shorter period here, 52%. Now the Kanyawara blue monkeys, so they're about 12 kilometers away in the same forest. They've increased a little bit, but not very much. So what's going on with the blue monkeys? Everybody else, their populations have been increasing dramatically. So why, why aren't the blue monkeys doing so well? And it's surprising that they wouldn't be doing well because this is a generalist species. I mean, they managed to survive in the middle of Nairobi, all right? There's a little park city park and they're doing great there so why aren't they doing great in Kivali it just it on the surface of things it really doesn't make sense so here uh we looked at three blue monkey groups and this is between 2013 and about 2018-19 and the mangabe groups that they overlap with so they have this weird sort of concordance or alignment to their home ranges so the bnt2 group overlaps a lot with the m northwest group BN1 with M East and BN5 a lot with M2 and a little bit with M South here. So thinking more broadly across sites in Kivali, not just the Ngogo site listed here, but starting Sebatoli, then going down to Kanyawara, Ngogo, Dura, and Minaro, we see a gradient in the density of blue monkeys. So there's a bunch of uh, blue monkeys at Sebatoli, and then there's fewer at Kanyawara, fewer at Ngogo, and then none in the southern areas of the park. Whereas the gray cheek mink bees here in gray and the red tailed monkeys show the flipped pattern. So there's a lot of them down here in the south, and their density decreases as you move north. And this is held up by some of the vertebrate census data from these uh, various sites. And basically, where there's a lot of mink bees, there's no blue monkeys. Uh, and as the density of mango bees or the relative abundance in this particular figure of mango bees decreases, we see more and more blue monkeys. Uh, but there's no site within Kibali that has just blue monkeys and no mango bees. Uh, instead, you, if you look out to the broader East African Albertine Rift area, uh, that's where you see this part of the graph filled in. So at sites like Budongo and Kakamego, there's a ton of blue monkeys. Uh, with some really spectacularly high population numbers, um, but there's no mink bees there. So we argue that perhaps there is some competitive exclusion that is happening between these two species, and it was not diagnosed in broad scale analyses of competitive exclusion between primates, because there are these sites like Kibali where the two species co-occur, but um, 
clearly there's there's something going on here in terms of their relationship to each other. So manga bees seem to have this sort of suppressive effect on blues. Uh, so there's a negative correlation between their population abundances. But what's driving variation in manga bees? So as I mentioned, there's relatively few manga bees in the north of the park, and then a lot of manga bees down here in the south. And from having studied the mangabe diet over several years, I can say that some of their favorite, favorite, favorite preferred foods occur in swamps. All right. So that's that's where they're really having a lot of intergroup conflict over access to these swamp foods. Um, and what we see within Kivali is that there's a gradient in the surface area that is swamp. OK, so in the north, there's relatively little. There's these big hills and between the hills and the valley bottoms, you have a little bit of swamp, but it's these narrow strips. And as you move south through Kibali, the hills get shorter and sort of squatter and there's more area that is uh, ends up being swamp. And Ngogo is kind of the threshold. So south of Ngogo, there are really aren't many hills at all. And so there's a lot of swamp area. And so what we think is happening is that there's this positive correlation between mangabees and swamps, and that is driving variation in the mangabee population, which is then driving variation in the blue monkey population. But how are mangabees affecting blues? How is that competitive relationship happening? That we don't really know. So I am currently working um, on analyzing some reproductive and metabolic hormones for the two species, and this is funded through an NSF grant. And so we're trying to figure out how, what is the mechanism by which competitive exclusion happens in primates. And so this is uh, funding a grad student. And currently we have 14 undergraduates working on different aspects of this project with a lot of fecal, a lot of urine samples. Um, so again, stay tuned and hopefully we'll have some um, interesting results on that in the coming year. So to recap, uh, it seems to be that competition from mangabees is constraining blue monkey population dynamics. Uh, and I really want to emphasize this point that competitive exclusion is not always detected at broad scales if you're looking for presence absence patterns. Uh, there could be uh, more subtle variation that is happening within sites where the two species are co-occurring, or at least within forests where those two species are co-occurring. So we're, we're advocating for an approach where instead of trying to predict primate abundances based on food availability, like the biomass of food trees. Instead, we really need to be taking into account the biomass of their competing species. So where to from here? This is the last set of slides, almost done here. Um, we've talked about between species competition and a little bit of between uh, social group competition. Uh, but really what we need to do to drive home this, this understanding of how these different species affect relationships within a species is look at interactions between individuals in light of between species competition. So um, I think that there's really exciting potential here. And it, if we think about the cockamega blue monkeys, I think they're a really good example of what can happen. So these are monkeys, blue monkeys studied by my uh, PhD advisor, Marina Kords in Kenya. And the thing is, for blue monkeys, what uh, has historically been expected for the species is that they would show a certain pattern of social relationships called resident egalitarian. <laughs> Try that again. Called resident egalitarian. So females are phylopatric, but the relationships among them are pretty sort of low key, not a lot of dominance, um, basically not a whole lot of agonism, and certainly not a lot of competition over food resources. And yet, there's strong competition between social groups. Uh, so it's a mixture of low within group contest competition or absent and then strong between group contest competition. But in fact, over the last several decades, what uh, Marina Cords has observed is that there's actually more of a pattern of resident nepotistic tolerant for this particular population. There's a little bit of evidence showing. Um, so the blue text indicates where they, they fit these predictions. Um, so there's a little bit of fitting of the, the resident egalitarian structure, but really there's, there's more evidence supporting the resident nepotistic tolerant for this population. So that would imply that they actually experience strong within group contest competition and between group contest competition. And uh, that, that's a little bit surprising, right, given predictions. And I think what's happening is that we have to pay attention to between species dynamics on a population level basis. So 
If we think about contest competition for food, we can ask whether that food is economically defendable, meaning it's limiting and monopolizable. And then we can look at the predicted patterns and the realized patterns of contest competition among individuals and among groups. So for something like a red colobus, which occurs in the same forest as the species I've been talking about, there really doesn't seem to be much evidence that their fruit is economically defendable. And so there's little or no contest competition among individuals or groups. For great cheek mango bees, yes, their food does seem to be economically defendable, evidenced by some competi contest competition among individuals and even among groups. But for the red tails and blues at Ngogo, or for Kibali, I should say, um, while there is evidence that their food is economically defendable because they're eating the same foods as the mango bees, there really isn't contest competition among individuals, but there is among groups. So um, I think that there's a spectrum here that these monkeys are falling into. And with manga bees, food is monopolizable against other species. They can kick these two smaller bodied species out of food trees. Um, and conversely for these smaller species, food is not monopolizable against other species. They're sort of subject to the whims of the larger competitors. So what happens if you take out some of the larger competitors, specifically if you take away manga bees, and especially if you take away chimpanzees, blue monkeys start acting like manga bees, all right? So they show strong contest competition among individuals. So I think that that is the, the role that between species competition is playing in primate socioecology. And so there's a lot of unanswered questions still about how this manifests um, in different forests with different sets of species. So one of the uh, future projects that we are uh, looking to develop right now is seeing if we can find a red tail population that would fit some of these predictions. Uh, so uh, Ronnie Stein is again, a graduate student in my lab. She has four uh, red tail groups across Uganda that she has been studying. Uh, so one here at Mabira in the Eastern part of the country, and then the other three in the Western part, two in, in Gogo, and then one just outside the park. And they vary in terms of the competing species that they encounter. So for the Rangobe red tail group up here outside the park, um, they're not competing with chimpanzees and they're not competing with manga bees. Whereas the Mabira red tails in the eastern side of the country are only competing with manga bees. And then she has this R13 group at uh, Ngogo, which has very little chimpanzee influence because it's a, a boundary area between chimpanzee home ranges. So they're, they're basically too scared to spend a lot of time in there. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but they do have a lot of competition from blues and manga bees. And then of course there's our core group, R1 one of those six core groups that has the full component or of co cohort of competitors. So what we're looking to see is uh, a, a gradient of social relationships across these four groups. And I'm really dying to know whether red-tailed monkeys can be despotic, uh, particularly at Rengope. So again, more work to come in the future. And with that, uh, I have a lot of people to acknowledge and thank for their help and support and participation in this work. So let me stop there. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was really, really interesting. And it, it looks like you've explored a lot of fascinating questions and lots more, more to come. Um, we have a few questions from the audience, if you don't mind answering those. Uh, so yeah, you talk quite a bit about the competition between species. Uh, we have a question here about um, affiliative interactions. Have you ever seen any direct interspecies affiliative interactions, including grooming, um, et cetera? Are these more frequent between different species of arboreal monkeys? Yeah, so we definitely do see affiliation between species. In fact, we see more affiliation between species than we see agonism or aggression. All right. And we have seen a little bit of grooming between species, although not as often as as, as seems to happen at Kanyawara. I'm not sure why. Um, and this affiliation. So in, in addition to grooming, we see juveniles playing together and the frequency with which we see specific monkey species uh, affiliating with each other seems to correspond with how much time they spend in each other's presence. So red tails and manga bees spend a lot of time together. And so there's, you know, the, the highest number of observations that we see per pair of species is with those two. Uh, blue monkeys, there's 
actually not very many blue monkeys at the site and they have small groups. Uh, so they don't tend to spend a whole lot of time with other species, but when they do, there's the occasional affiliation. But I should note that historically, there were red-tailed monkey, blue monkey hybrids, which indicates a special kind of affiliation. Um, <laughs> although we haven't seen any since the uh, Jerry Longa documented them in the 80s. And Tom Strusaker. Wow. Yeah. Okay, well, so there could be future hybrid species. Um, and so we have another question about fallback foods. Uh, when food is scarce, are there any fallback foods that are critical to the survival of any of these species? And if yes, is there overlap in the fallback foods that different species rely on? That's a great question. So um, I know that there is some debate as to what is a fallback food? Are these primates actually eating fallback foods? Um, so I, I want to avoid that. <laughs> what I will say is that when uh, ripe fruit or fruit in general is not available, each species does rely on different food items. Um, well, not, dis not necessarily super distinct, but for instance, manga bees are adapted for hard seed eating. So they will eat a lot of hard seed seeded food items if it's available. But of course, a lot of those are fruits, right? So, um, I haven't quite looked yet to see whether things like blyhea, which doesn't really have any soft pulpy flesh, it's just these hard seeds with a little lippity arrow on top of them, if the timing of that sort of alternates with fleshy fruits. Uh, but that's certainly something that manga bees go crazy over. Uh, they really love the hard seeded foods. So that seems to be what they're eating when they're not eating pulpy fruits. Um, but manga bees, blue monkeys, and red-tailed monkeys at Ngogo eat a lot of insects. And unfortunately, you know, we don't have a good way to really quantify the quantities or the calories of insects that they're eating, at least not without spending a lot of time sort of documenting that um, in a way that would sort of take away from our ability to, say, collect urine samples, things like that. Um, the other, the last little thing that I should highlight here is that all of these species, especially the red tails and the blue monkeys, are capable of eating a pretty high quantity of young leaves. So the Kanyawara site, also in Kibali, just you know, 12, 14 kilometers away, the red tailed monkeys there eat a lot of young leaves, a lot. And yet at Ngogo, they rarely, rarely eat young leaves and only from specific species that seem to be very high. Um, content or high nutrient dense uh, leaves. So um, again, there's a lot of overlap in their diets. The, the one sort of exception is the hard seeded items that manga bees will feed on. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I'll say or mm. that I can say right now about the non fleshy yeah. fruit part of the diet. Yeah, I mean, just even measuring all that variation. Um, it, it takes a lot of work. Um, yes. And that kind of brings us to a question around uh, methods um, and, and uh, the phenology uh, transects you mentioned. Um, in terms of assessing diet, did you record directly what individuals ate? Or did you also use any molecular or isotopic methods to have a finer grain detail of what plant parts are eaten? Yeah, so we uh, have been doing, a com well, depending on which project over the years, um, group scans or focal follows on individuals. And in both of those, we document what the individuals are eating so that um, you know, we can take the data from the phenology census and see what's available, and then we compare that against the items that are actually eaten. So, for instance, Ronnie Steinitz, the graduate student who's looking at red tail energetics, uh, she's putting together all of these pieces of the puzzle to sort of understand, okay, how does food avail availability manifest in foraging, manifest in energy balance moderated by chimpanzees? Uh, so, yes, we, we do have that data and we do take that into consideration. Well that sounds, yeah, like an interesting puzzle to put together. Um, we also have a question about methods uh, to do with, um, uh, yeah, other methods 
such a, so we have one comment saying, fascinating talk, thank you. Uh, I would love to hear a little more about UCP. How did you collect it? Did you analyze it in the field? I would also love to know more about collecting hormone levels from fecal samples. Did you do this in the field too? Okay. Yeah, so who knew I'd end up here, but I love urine and feces because it tells us so much <laughs> great stuff, right? Um, so there are a few little, you know, complications. So as I mentioned, red-tailed monkeys are small-bodied. They're up in the trees. And so when they pee, oftentimes it's just, you know, kind of drops it, sort of scatter around. So for me, I had, I had to have one person per group who focused entirely on samples, collecting these samples, because pipetting one urine sample can take 20 minutes and to, into a tube. And then, you know, you do your labeling and you stick it in a little cooler. Um, I could not analyze those samples in the field because the <laughs> equipment and the uh, chemicals that we use weren't available in um, the field or in Uganda in particular. Uh, so we've been doing all those analyses in the U.S. Um, in terms of the fecal samples, uh, that's actually... I would say that they're complementary to the urine samples. So urine gives you a relatively short window of time in which things have been happening in the body, right? And so depending on the biomarker of interest, that window could be a couple of minutes to maybe even a couple of hours. So C-peptide, um, it, it's produced in epimolar amounts with insulin. So as your body is responding to circulating glucose, it's taking a, mo a molecule of pro-insulin and splitting it into insulin and C-peptide, and then it's excreting C-peptide directly through the kidneys, or yeah. Um, and the time scale by which C-peptide is responding to food availability is kind of dependent on what type of food it is and how long the digestion time is for that food. Um, but again, we're talking about, eh, it, it changes within the course of the day. So clearly there's, there's a shorter time scale of variation for C-peptide than you would see for some other um, biomarkers. And in particular for feces, uh, th because these animals have a really slow digestive passage time, it's, a, it's about the same as what you would see for a much larger bodied primate like a chimp or a human. Uh, when you measure something like a, well, a steroid hormone, say cortisol or uh, estradiol, progesterone, from feces, you're getting this smoothed out average over 24 hours approximately uh, that is represented in the fecal sample. So if you're trying to look at how it responds to a discrete event, um, you wanna go with something that's urine-based or even salivary if possible, in some species it is. Um, but if you're okay with looking at just general trends in response to ecological conditions, feces is great. And feces is a lot easier to collect. So what we do is we, um, follow a modified version of the uh, protocol you published by Jacinta Beener and her lab group. Uh, so you take your fecal sample and you mix it up to get all those hormones really thoroughly mixed up. We pop it into a whirl pack bag. Uh, so just to preserve it a little bit, put it on ice while we're in the forest. At the end of the day, we bring it to camp and we do an extraction. So we extract the hormones from the feces at camp. Uh, and the benefit of that is that it can, um, the, the extracted hormones are really stable on the cartridges as, and so we can transport those at room temperature. Um, or the second alternative or the second option that we have is that uh, we dry the feces at camp. And again, it's very stable once it's been dried and then we can transport it to the US for either radio immunoassays or ELISAs. So um, I've, gotten a little bit addicted to being able to look at all these physical measures of the, the condition of the animals because it really gives us the fuller picture of what's happening um, in their bodies. It's, it's not enough to just measure food intake anymore. We really have to understand yeah. the, the fitness parameters associated with that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, as a follow-up to uh, the current question, were you also assessing parasitology levels when you analyzed fecal sample samples? If so, did C-peptide levels have any correlation to parasite load? Uh, 
somebody's out there reading my mind. So um, <laughs> we have uh, fecal samples that we have preserved in formalin specifically to measure parasite levels. And the other graduate student currently in my lab, Hannah Frog, uh, she is focusing on parasite levels and she will be answering that question in the coming year. So I don't have a short answer for you, but yes, we have uh, parasite samples. Yes, somebody is looking at that. And yes, we are gonna be comparing that with C-peptide. That's very exciting. And, it, and it's, um, it's great that these things can be stored for future research, because obviously when you're on the ground, there's kind of the restriction of manpower, as you highlighted, when you're trying to follow lots of different groups. But if you can collect these samples and use them in the future, it just provides so much material for, for research. Yeah. Um, and a few questions on um, your findings from the fecal and urine sampling sam samples. Uh, so did you find that for individuals within groups, um, previous years miscarriage predicted future successful births? Oh, I haven't looked at that yet, so I'm not sure. Part of the issue is that that time period that I showed where uh, we were looking at the unsuccessful pregnancies, we had that sort of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Alternating schedule of follows of different groups. So we'd follow a pair of groups for a couple of months, switch to another pair of groups for a couple of months, and then switch back to the first pair for a couple of months. So it wasn't guaranteed that we would come back to the original set of groups at the time when I could track and see when they're next producing infants. Uh, so and this is one of the downsides of trying to follow a lot, a lot of different groups is that yeah. we can't follow everybody simultaneously all the time. So we, we have to make a little bit of a trade-off in terms of when we follow groups. Mm, yeah. And, and did you have a measure for stress um, that you could uh, take into account um, for kind of looking at whether levels of stress uh, impacted uh, pregnancies? Yeah. So I did measure the fecal cortisol metabolites in the, um, from the feces and uh, let me think about what sort of patterns. I haven't published this yet because I have I'm a couple of students who are working on this data. So, okay, what I can say is that the results were not super simple at first pass. Uh, so it's not just a clear relationship of, you know, more stress in, in certain conditions. Uh, we were trying to take into account female reproductive status as that's known to affect some of these cortisol metabolite levels. Um, I, I can't say too much on it at this time, except that we are working on it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and we have more comments saying fascinating topic. Uh, a question uh, asking, has anyone looked at the recovery time of the trees after being browsed on by monkeys? If the monkeys eat the meristem, presumably lateral buds grow more so it may become bushier and while they are feeding do the trees react by producing bitter chemicals to deter the monkeys well that's a really interesting question which i cannot answer <laughs> um, so the the idea that herbivores actually stimulate more fruit production is really interesting um, and i think that that would be a great question for somebody to look at, especially in this sort of context, because I think a lot of what we know in that context or that question comes from, you know, domesticated animals browsing on orchards or something like that, or even from insect pests browsing on, on plants. But in terms of primates and the, the trees that they are relying upon, who knows? Um, what I can say, though, is that for some species, there's some evidence of over browsing in this forest. So for instance, Marcamia platycalyx is uh, a food item that all the monkeys love. And for decades at the Kanyawara site, apparently nobody had ever seen this fruit or this tree produce any fruit because the flowers were totally consumed by all the primates because there's such a high biomass of primates. So instead of like stimulating more fruit production in these trees, they were actually wiping out the tree's ability to reproduce um, because of the, the over consumption. Now that's, that's one sort of exceptional example that doesn't happen with a, a lot of species, but it, I do wonder, you know, what is the effect of having all these different consumers? And I should note that in terms of the between species competition that I've been looking at, 
part of the reason I say there's so much more to explore is I've only looked at the primate side of things, right? Mm. And yet primates are not the only fruit consumers in these forests. There are hornbills, there are gray parrots, there are mongooses, there are fruit bats, right? And you know that's what can access the fruits in the crowns of the trees. And then once the fruit has fallen, there's all sorts of terrestrial animals that are also consuming these fruits. Uh, and we have no idea how these non-primate animals are affecting the sociality and the fitness outcomes for the primate study species. Even more potentially impactful are the insects, right? So mm -hmm. insects that are eating leaves can reduce that tree's ability to produce fruit down the line. And just as with any other ecological community, this forest shows these fluctuations between years in terms of the abundance of particular consumers, whether it's hornbills or lizards or, or butterflies. So I think it was in 2019, we, uh, some of my lab group members and I were in the forest and there were more butterflies than I have ever seen. There's usually sort of a, a um, an annual, eruption of butterflies, but this was at least an order of magnitude larger. So that many butterflies would have been caterpillars a few months prior or a few weeks prior that, and they decimated some species of trees and those trees, uh, I have to look at the phenology data to see if they were even able to produce any fruit that year. So um, in terms of between species interactions, there's a lot left to figure out. Yeah. And I guess, I think in addition to that, you've then got carnivores, as you talked about that cat showing up and potentially wiping out a whole uh, troop of monkeys. And so you need a, an army of uh, researchers out there to kind of figure this all out. Um, uh, okay, thank you so much for your talk and your time. I'm just going to end on uh, on a question, uh, kind of linking what you've been talking about to um, human evolution. Uh, your work is is very interesting to think about selective pressures that may have acted in the past when various different hominin species are known to have ranged in a relatively small area. Um, especially when we know that different species were maybe more arboreal or terrestrial. Um, and do you have any thoughts about using your work to help model past scenarios where multiple primate species um, were sharing the same forested area, uh, including different primate species? Well, that's the dream, right? To be able to apply <laughs> what we learn today in these forests to ancestral uh, situations. So um, I think to really get at that question, we first need to figure out how much of what I'm observing at Ngogo is because of chimpanzees being predatory, right? Um, so yes, mangabees have an effect on red tails and on blue monkeys, uh, but it's a different type of effect than the chimpanzees have on the smaller bodied species. So that also leads me to think that different larger bodied competitors can have different effects on smaller bodied competitors. So that does complicate how we would understand uh, the ancestral bushiness of the hominin tree <laughs> and how <laughs> those different hominin species would have competed with each other. Um, but yeah, we've, I, we've only really started to think about this question, at least in my lab group, and how we can apply some of this information to ancestral recon reconstructions. Um, but that is, that is the long-term goal here. So, yeah. Well, it sounds like a really interesting, yeah big question to pursue and with lots of lots of other really really interesting avenues of research along the way um, so I'm sure we'll all be watching uh, what what comes out of your lab and thank you again for today's talk it was it was really interesting well thank um, you it's my pleasure I really appreciate the opportunity great and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we don't have weekly primate conversations uh, on this term, but we do have another event coming up on the 10th of May, same time, 3 p.m. UK time. Uh, that will be with uh, Robin Pickering. So that's 10th of May and we will see you all.